In this final lecture on ceramics, I want to talk about formation of ceramics via particulate methods. So we're going to begin with some clay forming methods um, and first talk about slip casting. So we need to define what a slip is first. So a slip is just a suspension of clay or uh, and or other particulate materials in water or, or some other uh, suspension uh, liquid. And then we can talk about slip casting as simply pouring the slip into some mold. The mold absorbs the water and after the water has evaporated uh, or being sucked out, it produces a green ceramic. Green just means that it's not been fired or dried. And so uh, it must be dried and fired later. So a visual of that is shown here where the purple represents the mold, the green is the slip being poured into the mold. Uh, it, as, it eva as the water is taken out of it, uh, being absorbed by the mold, some evaporation, the, the, um, obviously the, the part shrinks somewhat because there's mass being removed and we're left with a green ceramic. Uh, there's a kind of a complementary approach called drain casting, which is which is really similar. You pour the slip into a mold, except instead of expecting the mold to to be to fully uh, fill, you just are going to uh, allow there to be some thickness of coating around the edge of the mold to get sort of a hollow uh, component. So that's one uh, one method of uh, formations of uh, of a clay product. Another is going to require us to understand something kind of unique about clays, and it's called hydroplasticity, and that's plasticity that's induced by the addition of water. So what happens is that when water is added to the clay, remember how clay is structured. Clay is structured as a bunch of layers, um, uh, alternating layers of uh, silica and alumina. And so when, when water uh, is added, the water molecules fit in between those layered sheets. So here's an example of uh, cowling clay and what that looks like. And so what happens is that the water, let's say um, the water molecules bond in between these sheets and they weaken the van der Waals uh, forces so that, that reduces the effect of van der Waals bonding. And what that does is it allows uh, easy sliding of one layer relative to the other when any sort of an external force is applied. So think back to when we talked about metals. What, well, what did dislocations do? They allowed one layer to slip relative to the other. That's what gave us plastic deformation. It's the same thing here, except now we're sliding one layer of clay over another, and that's being facilitated by water molecules diffusing uh, uh, into in between the layers. So that's the phenomena that enables this next uh, formation method we want to talk about, which is called hydroplastic forming. So in hydroplastic forming, we are going to mix uh, clay particulates with water, and we're going to do it in such a way that it has a consistency that enables plastic deformation, but also enables the stability of the form shape, right? So we don't want it to be just mud that won't hold its shape after we deform it, but it has to be deformable. We can't just have it be a brick either. Um, so in this case, the, the, we're going to extrude this water clay mass that we that we've, uh, have uh, mixed uh, into whatever shape we want, uh, usually through a dye. And so this is a visualization of that. So the, the gray represents the clay billet. Uh, this, this ram applies pressure to force it through an extrusion dye, and then we get a part it's a green part again, right? We haven't done any firing or anything like that, so it still has moisture in it. It has to be later um, fired and uh, dried and fired. So those those are two techniques, um, um, slip casting and hydroplastic forming that produce a green ceramic um, that needs to be dried and fired. So let's go ahead and talk about the drying and the firing. Uh, hopefully drying doesn't require a, a, a glorious definition. Uh, it's just the removal of water from the green ceramic. So in this case, if the green ceramic has a bunch of clay layers and this is the wet body, then as the water uh, is removed, the, the um, particulates get closer together um, and finally it completely dries out. So the inner particle spacing as it decreases does create shrinkage in the part. So you do have to be aware of that. Um, if you dry too fast, then you can create non-uniform shrinkage, which will warp or crack uh, the part that you're trying to make. So that's the drying process. Once it's dry, you can move on to the firing process. 
And a firing process is basically heating the dry green ceramic uh, uh, up to not between 900 and 1400 degrees C to produce what's called vitrification. So what is vitrification? Well, vitrification is just the formation of a liquid glass from components in the clay. That liquid glass is going to flow into and fill some of the pore volume that we saw uh, that we that we see above. So here's a micrograph of porcelain. Uh, this particulate that it's that I'm pointing to here is uh, a silicon dioxide particle. In this case, quartz. And the, the vitrification has occurred in such a way that you, if you look around the boundary of that particle, and I highlighted that in green, it's actually surrounded by glass that formed during the firing process. So that's what firing does is it, it, creates, it creates a liquid glass that goes in and kind of acts as a, as a strengthening and a, and a binder for all these particulates. Okay. Uh, now let's just move on to a, a, a more general approach that's applicable to both clay and non-clay ceramics, and that's called powder pressing and sintering. So uh, powder pressing is exactly like it sounds. It's a compression of a powdered ceramic with some small amount of binder uh, into the desired shape, and all the binder does is it keeps the particles held in the shape that you you um, you press them into. So in this case, if we just press these, let's say, four particles together, they're held together loosely uh, by some binder. Uh, the compression that you use could be uniaxial, it could be hydrostatic, but it's still, it's just held together by this binder, which is not strong, so it's going to still require uh, firing. Uh, and in this case, it's going to, it's going to, the firing is going to result in sintering, which is a different process than vitrification that we just talked about. Uh, sintering is the coalescence of powder particles at high temperature. And so it, occ it occurs via diffusion, not, uh, a, not any sort of a liquid phase transformation. So uh, what's going to happen in the early phase is that you can start seeing that these part partic uh, the particles up here have grown together, uh, and they're going to form a grain boundary, and there's a pore there. And as, as the sintering continues, that um, the coalescence grows. Um, and so just be reminded that that's a diffusive process. It's not a, it's not a liquid process. Um, the final, um, I would say, traditional manufacturing process that I want to talk about is what's called tape casting. And tape casting is just the uh, thin sheets of green ceramic produced as a flexible tape. Uh, and there's, this is a, just a figure from your book. Uh, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's used for integrated circuits and capacitors, and it's essentially the same thing as slip casting, right? Remember, slip casting was where we put a slip. This is this is a um, uh, suspension of particles into a mold and let the mold absorb the the moisture. In this case, now we still have slip, but instead of having a mold absorb the moisture, we have an evaporative uh, effect that's that's removing the moisture, but it's still producing the same um, green structure. Okay, the, the, the finale of all this is actually um, maybe not a, a forming process exactly or, or anything that's different from the ones we've talked about, but it's a little bit um, uh, more cutting edge than the stuff we've talked about. And that's the 3D printing of ceramics. So there's two uh, classes of 3D printing of ceramics that I want to cover. The first is just an inkjet. And all that is is the the shooting out of an ink that's a liquid binder with some ceramic particles that are that are uh, embedded in it, and it prints it. So you can get basically a green ceramic part via the building up of layers of the of an inkjet. Uh, that part still has to be fired, um, and so that the the particles center together uh, to form a, a a final ceramic. But that's one methodology, uh, one that that I am uh, uh, intimately involved with and, and familiar with is the stereolithography or SLA or digital light processing, that's DLP, uh, of, uh, of ceramics. So there's two ways that you can, you can print ceramics with these methods. The first is just like almost with the inkjet where you load the polymer resin with ceramic particles. You, you, the, the polymer acts as a binder, the particles are in close contact, and then you, you center the particles together, you burn off the polymer, and, and you're left with the resulting uh, final ceramic. Uh, 
that's not what I what it, what we work on, at least in my research group. That's not what we've been focused on at the University of Wyoming. Uh, we've been focused on what's called polymer-derived ceramics, and I didn't talk uh, extensively about this when we talked about polymers uh, because it's a kind of a, a bit more of an advanced topic. But basically, rather than printing a traditional polymer, so we talked about polymers being uh, long chain carbon molecules or carbon base molecules with the carbon backbone. There are also, uh, still in the polymer category, long chain silicon backbone molecules. And so what we do is we print these silicon backbone polymers uh, instead of the carbon base as a resin. And then we do what's called pyrolysis. Um, and pyrolysis is the heating of, of that part um, in the absence of oxygen. So we pyrolyze what we, these silicon-based polymers that we print, we pyrolyze them at about 1,000 degrees C and it converts that long chain silicon backbone into a, in, in our case, an amorphous glass-like silicon-based ceramic. Uh, in, th in this case, we're producing silicon oxycarbide. So I kind of wanted to uh, uh, toot our own horn. So my research, my research group and uh, Dr. Frick's research group uh, we recently published this paper, uh, Stereolithography of Silicon Oxycarbide Polymer-Derived Ceramics Filled with Silicon Carbide Micron Whiskers. Um, so you'll, uh, the, this figure actually came from this paper. So this paper came out, I think, a couple years ago. Uh, you can see some of the things that we printed. There's a gear. Um, there's some hexagonal thing, a wheel. These are actually turbine veins that we printed. Here's a an example of a really fine lattice structure. And of course, we're representing Wyoming well by printing a bucking horse as well. So all of these are actually uh, 3D printed ceramics. And so I just wanted to make you aware, you know, it's not in your textbook or anything, but UW, uh, Dr. Frick's group and myself was the first to print a, a to 3D print a ceramic matrix composite uh, using polymer-derived ceramics. So uh, uh, obviously not a, a mainstream method of production, but certainly one given given that you're here at UW, you should be aware of. So uh, I hope th hope you found that interesting. Those are all the, the, um, the major uh, methods for fabricating ceramics that I want you to be aware of, at least for this class.